Good evening, all, and welcome to another installment in our discussion about leadership and leadership issues that are facing, well, leaders in organizations in the Caribbean and across the world. My name is Marjorie Wharton, and I am joined by my colleague, Sonia Lynn Gartside. Hi, Sonia. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Marjorie. How are you? I am doing well. A little bit melting from this heat, but beyond that, doing well. Well, you, <laughs> I'm happy to say we are not, we don't have any heat down here, but, or is it up here? Where is Okay. So you have another issue. Yeah. We've been complaining <laughs> about the heat here because it's unseasonably warm. <laughs> oh, and I've been complaining that we haven't gotten any spring. Like, where is spring? Why am I oh. seeing shower, you know, snow squalls up here? Yes, there are several theories on why the climate is not behaving as it used to. Yes. <laughs> but our topic this evening, moving on to what we're supposed to be talking about, our topic this evening is about leaders, not boss, well, leader, not boss. We are going to be unveiling the mysteries of power and influence. And mm -hmm. as I put into the description, we really were inspired to have this discussion based on an article that you wrote for her agenda, Sonia, where you, you talked about women in power or in power positions and really sought to dispel some of the myths around using that term boss. Mm -hmm. So um maybe you can set us up a little by talking about it when you think about that when you think about the term boss and you talked about things like referring to yourself as girl boss and and you know women perhaps behaving or taking on some of the characteristics of male leaders whether or not that was a successful way for them to go maybe you can just get us started by talking a little bit about what inspired you to choose that as a topic for an article what were you seeing? What was I seeing? Oh, I was seeing women who, you know, that term girl boss was bandied all over social media um, at some point where people were talking about being a girl boss. And then, you know, the trajectory, it starts, it rises, it hits its peak. And then coming down, we realized that the whole idea of being a girl boss was you, you were seeing significant women who were praised for being a girl boss crashing and landing, basically, mm -hmm. where um, you're on the cover of, um, you know, business magazines one day and then the next day there's, um, you know, expose on the fact that the people in your organization are burnt out, um, exhausted and complaining about the very same things that they um, complained about in normal corporate life. Mm -hmm. And so it was written about the myths of the girl boss and what people think it is versus what it really is. And to summarize, it's basically saying that being a woman leader is not just adopting the characteristics of what is known to be male leadership. That doesn't mm -hmm. work. Just mm -hmm. having the same approaches, the same ways of operating, and instead, it's a, a woman's face you're seeing instead, that that mm -hmm. is not successful. That is a myth, right? Mm -hmm. And so dispelling the myths that are usually associated with that. Okay. And so what I thought when I saw that article, and I thought it, it could be a good discussion for us to have, was really, yes, to use that as part of our talk, but also to really explore what it means then for a woman as a leader and um, being a boss, but not necessarily adopting characteristics that are not your own, but instead finding things, perhaps learning from male counterparts, learning from other females who have walked that path and taking really what is going to work for it each of us as an individual so that we can find a way to be more successful as a leader because power is important and mm -hmm. influence is important you know um, i saw something one time that said that power is perhaps the last dirty word in the english language because you know if somebody says well i need to have power that is seen as a negative thing and so i think that our discussion really to 
can center around what are some of the positive things that we mean when we say you need to have power if you're going to be a successful and effective leader. And so for me, when I think of power, I really think of the fact that you have to have influence. You have to be able to you know, pick up the phone or have a meeting with the people that matter. And you have to know who to call and you have to have the ability to make that connection. And so power has a lot to do with your ability to really make things happen. So what do you think then about uh, maybe getting and, and using power effectively? Yes. And I think that's leadership. You know, when we talk about what's your leadership, why should people um, follow you as a leader? Um, what's your leadership style? It's basically about the way that you use power to accomplish goals. Mm -hmm. So um, again, I think women are only socialized to see power as, you know, a negative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not men. Um, men going after power is just seen as normal and what they should be doing. It's just um, societal norms that says, oh no, as a lovely, delicate lady, you should not be doing that. And, and so encouraging us basically to give up our power mm -hmm. and not have agency and utilize it. So I think one of the, when we talk about this title, leader, not boss, and I think women, and I said it in the article that women fundamentally understand that just because you've been appointed somebody's leader or boss doesn't make them a part of your team you find you know it doesn't um that's where you have to hone your leadership style to say okay how am i going to utilize this power what am i going to show people that makes them want to follow me and if they don't make them realize that you don't just stick around here you can exit <laughs> Mm -hmm. This is not a jail cell. You can leave if you do not want to. Don't stick around there and, and become a burden. And so um, I think power is an important topic. It's something that if you are going to be a great leader, a great woman leader, that mm -hmm. you should be really thinking about how do you, um, you know, how do I want to utilize my power? Yeah. And one of the things that I discovered in really doing the research for this session one of the articles that I found, I, I think it was one of the, or it was the one that I linked on, I posted on LinkedIn in the comments. It talked about the fact that communication and your ability to communicate effectively is one of the, the things that women need to develop as a skill if they're going to effectively build that power. And really, when you think about it, that is one of the things we always say that leaders must have. You must have the ability to articulate your vision and you must have the ability to persuade people and influence them to follow you so that they can help you turn it into something that's real and not just an idea. And mm. so if you are going to, to take on a leadership role, especially if it's not a, a situation that as soon as you you take up the role you recognize that okay these people just aren't listening to me and, and I need to I need to do something in order to get them excited and engaged then your ability to communicate with them your ability to share your vision your ability to tell them why it matters and more importantly your ability to listen which is the part of the communication process that a lot of people forget about that really is what can be useful in helping you to, you know, make that connection and really show that leadership skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what would you say if you had to, um, what would you say maybe are some of the things that you need to be concerned about as you attempt to build your power base in an organization? Hmm. Let me think. Um, let me look at my notes. <laughs> what should I start with? <laughs> well, the first thing I think you should be, what should you be aware of as you start to, to develop your power base? Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Um, is to be aware of that there can only be one type of thinking and behavior. Mm. Competition is okay mm -hmm. um, in terms of when you're looking to build allyship, when you're looking to build networks of people who 
um, could come together around a particular goal and you can move forward. But sometimes because for a lot of women, particularly black women in um, outside, of course, the Caribbean where black women are just awesome and accepted as leaders, um, where you're not seen, at, you're not often seen, you, you are practically visible in that you are often the only one, but yet invisible because they don't see you as a leader. They see you as some person there to assist or to help. The behavior where because of the scarcity due to discrimination and, or, and the system, sometimes we can, people can be seen as protecting that space. Mm -hmm. You're like holding out people. It's not that you're competing, but you are seen to be just trying to be the only one because of the trauma of being the only one. So I think the first thing that you want to do as a leader in, in honing your power base is not to see other people who look like you as the enemy or to have that mindset come in that there can only be one woman here so it better be me and i gotta protect this role recognizing and acknowledging when you see that coming up removing it shaking it out of your head or learning it and then figuring out how can we work together to advance so yeah mm -hmm. that would be my first thing okay so here are my thoughts on that because i'm gonna i'm gonna not push back or not disagree, I should say, but maybe push a little just to mm -hmm. say this, that we can almost understand why that happens because of all of the other reasons that you just articulated in a situation where there really is only one option available. There is only one person considering in an organization that perhaps only has one token female of color. Mm -hmm. And there are 20 women of color who are qualified and capable for it. You can yeah. almost understand why there's that level of competition where is precisely why there is that struggle and that kind of clamoring to get to the top almost like you know because when you say that what popped to mind is you know that old series the highlander where there can be only one so you used to cut off the that's where it came okay from there you know where it's like <laughs> there can be only one and it's like yeah that, <laughs> the that, of the others. that doesn't yeah. work for you though in reality because <laughs> that's what i was going to say that's what i was going to say that even though you have that competition you mm. want to recognize that you don't want to destroy all the others so competition is good but it's almost um what has to be considered is how you compete yes and there's a fine line when you, so recognizing when this is a systemic issue at play mm -hmm. and how that can influence you. So we talk about leadership and leadership is all about self-awareness, right? Reflection. And so you are going into a system that there's a lot of scarcity. And so you are going to feel the pressure and you hear it a lot with black women where they're like, well, I represent the entire race. And if I do, if I, if I mess this up, they will never hire another black person. And it's like, excuse me, who can operate under that pressure? That is too much pressure. No, no, no. That's mm -hmm. not a, that's not a my friend that you go in there. All right. That is an unrealistic expectation that you, you represent an entire race. No. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn to, when you fall into that trap, to say, no, I reject that. That is not, um, men don't think that <laughs> when they're going, if I, if, I, if I screw this up, they will never hire another man. No, they don't think that. And so you have to know when to reject the system and, this, and, 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 and not fall into those traps that puts on due pressure on you and just gets heavier and heavier as you go on and just makes you very and it really affects your mental and physical health and i like the fact that you referenced to men because generally when we are thinking of men competing for a job there is the healthy competition that goes along with it but it is viewed differently mm -hmm. so you you are right it's almost like you know it's a game we're here to see a may the best man win. And in some instances, it is true that the loser leaves the organization, depending on how high up the role is. But it's not a it's not a scorched earth position. 
So it's not that, you know, I, I destroy everything else around me so that I alone can survive. But it really is a competition. And so that's definitely something that we can learn as we go forward in terms of understanding how to compete for roles in the organization. So. Yes, and that means understanding when you have been traumatized because to get where you are, if you were the, you know, one of two women, um, only one, the only black person or person of color, there's certain things that you had to encounter and push through. Mm -hmm. And so recognize that what that means is that when you get in a position of power, which is where we talk about leadership, how do I use my power? Mm -hmm. Don't use it to say you have to be just like me all mm -hmm. i had to push through i could take time off i couldn't i didn't even have you know maternity leave and now you want time yeah now you have power use your power to affect the system so that mm -hmm. it's good because and if you and that has to be intentional because if if it's not intentional the very nature of the system that created the only one um mm -hmm. the pressures that will will you mm -hmm. will just organically go towards that. And so mm -hmm. that's the first thing, because um, we know there are, when you look at the research, the research tells you that women are better leaders. It's just, mm -hmm. it's, you know, they are better leaders. All the research tells us that. And um, so if you want to be the better leader as if from the lens of a female, then these are the things you're gonna have to reject. If not, you turn into what, you know, the boss, lady you know the the um girl boss phenomenon was which is you're female but you're doing exactly the same things mm -hmm. as men and we know that doesn't work yeah and failing at it because it, it may not be what is natural and it may not be what fits right mm -hmm. um, another thing that i've found from doing the research is that they have found part of the reason why women are better leaders is because they have a more collaborative approach mm -hmm. to leadership. And so it's more about bringing the team in. And what you mentioned just now, recognizing that uh, more diversity is allowed. So it has been shown that women in leadership roles tend to be more successful when they are able to do that, when they're able to you know, build the team and encourage the team and recognize that everybody does not have to be the same as you have, have you said, that you can have that kind of diversity and different types of diversity are allowed and given opportunities to thrive. When you encourage that and encourage collaborative effort, there is greater chance of success happening for the organization and so it's recognized that in many organizations the systems do not allow this to happen and so the way that they are operating right now really does have that that male orientation that male focus in terms of how an organization should work and so it seems like most women then are being judged against criteria that really doesn't align with what women use to be more successful as leaders. Precisely, which is why you need that awareness because if you don't have that awareness that you're gonna be out there trying to maintain the status quo in an attempt to fit in, you know? So you, you're gonna come in and say, I wanna be accepted here. I want, I want to fit in. I don't want to stick out in a negative way. I want to be seen as successful. Mm -hmm. but if you, if you don't do that self-interrogation, that's what you're going to be, as opposed to the the strength I bring as a leader is not the current status quo, which we know are not working. Because anytime you look at employee engagement um, numbers for the last 20 years, it just keeps going down and it, it's, it's tanking. This work, this style of leadership is familiar, but not productive. Um, it's a sign of flogging people and it only works for a short time and this this is why people are you know you, you're not when you're a leader now it's so hard for you to to engage because you're trying to utilize a style that we know is not going to work mm -hmm. and, and that research tells us it's not going to work and if you as a female leader um a woman of color a black woman coming into an environment trying to maintain the status quo and fit in it's going to be hard for you. It's going to be rough for you out there, sis. Mm -hmm.
just accept that. And that is why that self interrogation, that reflection as to intentionally determining how do I want to use my power in addition to how do I, as you said, create that power base, those two questions are very important. Hmm. Okay. So that's good to know. So we've talked a little bit then about what we can do in order to, to create that power base, in order to have that sense of, of, you know, create an environment in which you can succeed. Mm -hmm. Now, as we mentioned at the beginning, that leadership has to do with really the ability to establish a vision and then influence people to follow it. And one of the things that we know is based on work by researchers like Marcus Buckingham and, and the strength theory, Clifton strength theory and, and those other things. We mm -hmm. know that different people in the organization are motivated in different ways because they have these things called triggers. Mm -hmm. and so what we understand is that in order for a leader to really build influence in order to convince other people to follow them and help them make their vision into a reality, that one of the things you have to master is being able to speak in the language that those individuals understand, mm -hmm. i.e. W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me? So <laughs> a key part then, maybe that is one of the key mysteries of, of really understanding how influence works. A lot of people talk about you have to be able to motivate people, but you're really not motivating them. You're hoping that you understand what it takes to convince them to buy into making your vision happen. The motivation happens when you can find the trigger, the thing that they're interested in, the thing that they're excited about, and that's how you influence people. So if you're really going to try and figure out how to get people to work with you, and to really consider you as a leader, that understanding of them and understanding what will influence them is a key thing that a leader needs to engage in. Yes, I agree. And I assume you're asking, how would a leader know that? And well, um, I, I was pausing for your your contribution <laughs> after that statement, but I just love how we're going this evening. We're agreeing on everything. We haven't had this in a long time. This yeah, I know. Time. Well, yeah, we're saying it's like you ask them. All right. Because what a key thing I like to say here is that it has to be win-win. Hmm. You know, it, before the old style way was you come and fit into how we organize you know mm -hmm. which is you need to be a cultural fit which we know we understand now i think most people understand now that's just a way to know any diversity whatsoever and when i say diversity i am talking about more than just race gender and ethnicity across the spectrum of diversity that's just you're just shutting people out and in a world where people are aware of the diversity we, you know whether it's newer your newer divergent whether um which which where you fall on that spectrum socioeconomic in terms of class wherever country because uh, we're more in a global um, organization that approach of you come and you fit into what we want is over now is, there's an exchange there's a more power is lays within the employee seeking a job and the leader seeking an employee and so what you're saying is so important that you understand that it's not just about what you want mm -hmm. anymore. It's about finding out what this person has, because ultimately engagement is an internally is internally driven, right? You cannot consistently just be externally trying to motivate, you know, that's like the mm -hmm. carrot. What yeah. So it has to be where you're you're seeking to find out well, what do you want as an employee and let me show you how by joining with us towards this goal will get you what you need we will win you will win as well and that's the task that um so many leaders are on skill that they are skilled at using power to dictate 
but not to, as you say, persuade and influence. And persuading and influence and the listening that you talk about, mm -hmm. um, you need to listen to persuade and influence. You need to know what people want to be negotiating and to influence and to persuade people to say, hey, by following me and doing this, you're going to get X, Y, and Z, which is what you need and what you want. And that's where the magic of engagement happens in that alignment. So yes, we agree, but it's not a bad thing that we agree. <laughs> Because certain and things are just you. true. Right. And thank you for adding that because that really expands on it. And it really emphasizes why it is something that is important that leaders need to engage in and leaders need to practice. And you're absolutely right that there are a lot of people who think that it's easier to just dictate and it's easier to tell people what to do. But that is really how we have wound up in the situation we now have where so many managers feel that their employees are only there to do what they tell them. And if they're not there to breathe down the employee's neck, then the employee will do nothing. It's because you have not engaged with them. You have not connected with them. You haven't built that relationship where they can see themselves in the vision that you've outlined so that they are willing to put out the work in order to make it happen. Yeah, you have no power here is what they're saying to, to um, mm -hmm. leaders, right? Yeah. Um, because when we talk about power and leadership is you have no power to force me to do what I don't want to do. And mm -hmm. if you are going to do, then I'm not going to budge until you tell me exactly what you want in great detail, yeah. right? And these are from the same people that said, don't tell me what to do. Yeah. <laughs> They go from, don't tell me what to do. I know what I'm doing. I'm out there. I'm pushing to, I need more detail. Exactly what do you want? And that's a sign, not that they're difficult. It's a sign that you are unskilled. Now, mm -hmm. it is absolutely so easy. It is so much easier just to tell people what to do and let them go off and do it. I admit that. I would love to do that. You know, I always think that I'm highly skilled at telling people what to do. <laughs> but I realize that just because it's easy doesn't make it right. And mm -hmm. it's not going to help in the long term. So this is where you and I start to part because, you know, I get very, I am not hearing you with people being difficult. You are highly unskilled, right? <laughs> and I'm not accepting that. And yes, it does take effort and energy as a leader for you to do this work. But if you're not going to do the, not going to do the work, then don't be a leader. That's it. Basically it's that. Don't be a leader. Yeah. It's not easy. This is why they pay you the big buck. Singular. Yeah, I've been telling a group of people. Um, I've been I had a group I was working with all last week, and I've been telling them that every time this is why they pay you the big bucks, and they always laugh at me out of the room, what big bucks, right? Because everybody's complaining they don't get paid enough, but they still pay you more than the people who report to you. And there's <laughs> a reason why you want to be exactly where you want because you still see the power that you have. What you are frustrated yeah. with is that the power isn't working the way I think it should or yeah. it used to. And leadership is all about on learning and relearning, reflection, yeah. you know, reflecting, learning, and on learning. So yeah, you you made and so such a critical be, point. And so it begins first with an understanding that you need to learn and that you need to be someone who who influences others and that you cannot just always be directing people and seeing that as a secret to your success. Yes. All right. So Sometimes you do that, but yeah, you, you can't just re not over rely. If, exactly. If that's your only way, then you are not going to be successful because we all yes. know that different times require different styles and different people require different styles at different times. Right. And that authoritative directive style, we know that that is significantly negatively correlated to engagement significantly negatively correlated so if you are over relying on that mm -hmm. then you're just making your life hard yeah so having said that what then are some of the things that the individual as leader can do in order to improve their ability to wield power and their ability to influence others Hmm. And so um, I can start. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my first recommendation 
is that you need to build a strong network of individuals who you can reach out to and connect with. Because we say that leadership, sorry, well, leadership, yes, but power. Power comes from being able to reach out to individuals and it comes from knowing who to call, who has decision-making ability, knowing that you can reach out to them and request resources when required. You can request support when required. And a lot of that happens only if you, if you either know the person directly or know how to connect with them directly. Because you might know a name on the masthead of the, or the letterhead of the business, but are you connected to them in any way that you can reach out to access resources? Uh, additionally to your network, you also want to make sure you have mentors. You want to make sure you have sponsors and sponsors. It has been shown is very important when it comes to your growth as a leader and your development as somebody who has influence because sponsors mean that your name gets mentioned in rooms that you're not in and it will always happen or it may often happen that there are times when individuals are making decisions and you're not in the room. And the only way that you, your capabilities, your possibility, the opportunity even comes your way is because somebody who has the power to be there is actually going to mention you as someone for consideration. So power means you have the sponsors, you have the mentors, you know who to call so you can get access to resources. That's my first one. Yeah, I think that's the only one. <laughs> oh, yes, that community-centric approach, particularly if you're in a global organization. If you're in a global organization and you're only familiar with the people in your country, you're it's wasted opportunity, and mm. you're making life hard for yourself. And I think mm. nationally, right, internationally, the the this is such a key thing that we should unpack. Because leadership is not, you know, when I was growing up, I should say, the image of a leader is that lone man, it was always a man, <laughs> standing, surveying, making a decision on how the world should be shaped. And we still have that image of what that is leadership, a lone male. But in today's world, that's why that, is breaking because it's not about you being alone. Mm. It's about you having a community to support you. And that, as you're saying, I'm just gonna re-emphasize what you're saying because that is so critical to your success that if you don't get this right, nothing else will work. If you, you know, line up, imagine dominoes all lined up to be toppled. This is the first domino that needs to fall for all the others to, to create the image that you're looking for. And that community-centric approach, where you understand that it's not just about mentors, but sponsors are so critical mm. to your success. And one of the things we know from research is that women and black people and people of color have are given lots and lots of mentors, people to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. and not enough sponsors at all mm -hmm. you, you throw a rock and you will hit a mentor <laughs> we need some sponsors here and mm -hmm. so that sponsorship is critical and that means that you as you're saying have to reach out and create a community that you call upon those knows where in bureaucratic organizations you know there's a vertical structure, but now we're looking at network nodes throughout where you're, you're, you're pulling, you're calling on people who have different knowledge that you can utilize, whether it's in finance, it's in marketing, wherever, across the organization, recognizing those people that have, um, and different authors have different names for them, like, you know, the connectors in the organization mm -hmm. that can give you information. That that is something that you really need to spend time doing after, of course, that initial work of knowing who you are and doing that self-interrogation so that when you're stepping into that community and you're building that community, you're intentionally building a community that the collection will give you enough power, enough um, weight 
to move the organization and the culture and the system in the ways that you you want it to and that you don't just get caught up in preserving the status quo and so i i think that um some person if you're looking on and you are struggling to be a leader you feel exhausted every day you feel like you're pushing a boulder up a hill only to wake up the next day to realize that you just roll back down when you were having your two hours of sleep that the interrogation you start with and then you start with this the community building the mm. yes call but looking for sponsors and to look for sponsors people always say how do i do that well you know what this is not something that you walk up and ask people for you know i said <laughs> when it comes to figuring out what your employees want just ask them don't be going out there asking people to be sponsors this is where you demonstrate value and you show your work and you communicate and connect with people so you can tell them what work you are doing and they will then think as you say they will then think about you in um, rooms that you're not in because you're communicating what you have done you're showing the value that you have done and you're making those connections so we can't over rely this rely on this because this is such a foundational piece okay all right and to add to that, I would also say, because this just popped into my head when you were talking, I always say to people uh, when I'm coaching them, leaders, that you want to get to know the gatekeepers in the organization. The gatekeepers. So, you know, you walk into the organization and you want to have an appointment with this person and nobody can get access to it. And everybody's complaining that this person's secretary or their assistant is so rude and so rough and they don't they don't interact well with people and da 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 if you want to get past that person to get access to the person you want to speak to you have to build a relationship with the secretary or the assistant or whatever title that person has because that person is the gatekeeper they make the decision if you get access or not because generally a lot of leaders and decision makers in organizations are very busy and so they rely on the people who assist them to help them read out what is considered unimportant and if you can't get past that gatekeeper just so you know they are considering you to be unimportant the way that you will get access, the way you will get your questions answered, the way you will get your project proposals looked at, even if they're not approved, but the way that you will be able to invite that person to the event that you're organizing and, and you know, look really impressed. Well, how come they always come to your event? You want to get that happen? Make sure you know the gatekeepers. And a lot of people are very rude to secretaries and assistants, and they're very rude to what they consider custodial staff in, in organizations that they walk into. But a lot of those people are the ones who have the real information that can help you when you need to make a critical decision. So don't overlook that. Remember to treat everybody with respect because you never know who's watching and you never know how that can impact your ability to get access to the people that you're trying to connect with. So I, I would add that on as you build your network. Yes, so you have that's a good one. Let's tease that out a little bit. So when you say to them, you are unimportant. Don't take that as an insult. That you are unimportant right now. Because you are until they right. know you. Until you make a connection, they have other things and they're busy they doing their, other, their own stuff. Exactly. And sometimes people neglect to do the work. They're so busy trying to say, oh, oh fabulous. Like, well, what have you done? Have you taken the time to build the really, as you said, the trust and to do the work? And so just like you ask with employees, what do they want? You have to ask, what does my leader want? What stresses are they under? What are they seeing? What keeps them up at night? And until you know that, then you know and that may be as you say the gatekeepers is the one who build that relationship so that you know so that when you do have their time you're not wasting it and um and so don't take it personally when you're unimportant take it as okay i don't have enough information because mm -hmm. when i'm because i'm obviously saying you need to meet because and that because whatever you know you're given isn't yeah. critical so don't take it personally and if you have a good uh, mentor, they will tell you that. Yeah. And so the second thing that I would say you need to do in order to build that power base and create a lot more influence is you need to build your personal brand. 
because what is the use? I always say that to people. <laughs> I always do because what is the use of you being out here, being fabulous and fantastic and amazing, and ain't nobody know that but you? <laughs> Your brand is what you stand on. Your brand is what people can talk about. If you can say to somebody, well, you know, I am someone who can do well in blah blah blah. You list off the things that you do well at. So, for example, if you think about it, Sony and I have taken the time to build our brand. So we have a clear idea of what we are good at. And we know how to explain that to people. It doesn't mean that we're good at everything, but we know what we're good at. And we know what people care about that we focus on. And so that's how we will describe it. So we talk about the fact that we're coaches. We talk about the fact that we help people to grow and develop. We talk about the fact that we help leaders to win and the fact that organizations choose us to help them select the decision that they want to go in for the next five or 10 years, because that's part of who we are. That's part of the value that we bring. That's part of how we deliver. Have you taken the time to sit down and identify and then articulate what value you bring? Because that mm. is the brand that then somebody else can go say, well, you know, I worked with them on this project and they did this. I worked with them on that, or I always have seen them doing this. Or anytime you need somebody to do that, they can do this. You have to build your brand and make it easy for people to tell your story. If it's too complicated to explain what you do, how can a person in a meeting when a decision has to be made explain why somebody else should choose you? They'll pick somebody else who has an easier brand to explain. So it's important mm -hmm. for you to talk about how you want to be talked about. Now, I always say this, time and place. So don't be now that every time you open your mouth, the only thing we hear about is your brand and how fabulous you are. Don't sit in the lunch room every time you go to lunch there. You do it on yeah. Tuesday, do it on Wednesday, do it on Thursday, do it on Friday. And every time people see you, because after a while, people will start to joke about it. But you do want to say it often enough in the right places so that the right people hear it. And it's okay to say a little bit and brag a little bit about yourself. It's not bragging if it's true. And if you don't remember this, if you don't articulate your brand, nobody else is out there articulating it for you. Okay. So we start, here's where we start to part where, you know, we say the same thing, but in different ways. Off you go. There you go. Now, research often shows, and, I, and there's a book um, I have to, um, I'll, I'll drop it into the link uh, later, where um, a man who studied this says that men are appointed as leaders because they're often com confident and not competent. Women are competent but are socialized not to be confident. And so when you say build your personal brand, immediately that goes to mind is, oh my God, I'm surrounded by people who just spend time doing personal brand and not spend time being competent, <laughs> right? So it almost leaves a little, almost bad taste in your mouth because you're like, oh, oh, not your, that's just I don't your, want. Um, hmm? that, that's not everybody. That's just a bad taste in your mouth. Well, yes. And I feel like there are lots of women who are like me. Um, who feel like, oh, no, I don't want to be like that person who sits there and spend more time networking and, and, and presenting a facade, because we know it's a facade, about how great they are when they're really not good. Now, that's not, okay, that's not branding, by the way. Yes. As somebody who's precisely. trained in marketing, I want to say to you, that's not branding. That's because not branding. So a core part of branding is you have to be able to live up to the promise of your brand. Right. So I just want to acknowledge that for some women, um, we don't know that because what we've seen is people bragging and um, not being able to back it up with any um, solid, what do you call it, performance. We all know incompetent leaders who we all add, how do they keep getting ahead? why so it's important to add not so for those of you who feel the way i do i do want to say okay let's talk it through that branding is not that right when you hear the personal brand i always have to remind myself of building a personal brand is not that building a personal brand as you indicated is really being clear on who you are and the value you bring and being able to articulate that 
and making it easy to be understood. Because if you do not do that, if you um, just continue to go ahead and keep working hard and keeping your head down and 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 um, and not talking about it, then you're not going to get anywhere. And that's so. how the incompetent ones with the better brand are able to get the job because they're incompetent, but they have a great message. Yes, yes. They, they, they so talk about what they want to be. If, you're in, <laughs> if you are competent and capable, just imagine if you layered an excellent brand on top of that, you'd be right. able to deliver what you promise. Right, absolutely. Now, okay, so we agree right there. So we approach it from a different angle, like understand that, you know, this may not... You don't want to be um, what do you call inauthentic, and you may not be. You, you want to be clear on who you are, the value you bring, because as you say, if no one hears about it, you know, did it really exist? In today's world, where they say, if I don't see a video or a picture, I don't, I don't, I don't think. <laughs> it's why everybody stick a picture of everywhere <laughs> they go. I mean, whatever. Yeah. I go. And it takes me back to the old saying that our ancestors had about keeping your light under a bushel. Mm -hmm. So don't keep your light under a bushel. Under you have the bushel. light, let it shine. Yes. Now let's go to the bragging. Cause you know, I often say to people, you have to keep a bright book and a bright book is the things that you hear people say, Hey, this is how you add value to me. This is so helpful. You were clear. Keep it so that when, when you, when you need to pull it out, you are ready and you're not just, you know, stuttering when people ask you. And as you say, you have to know when and where because women face a double bind. Um, black women are some of the most qualified people in the face of the planet because they have to be. They're often asked to prove, you know, prove to me that you can do it. And women face the bind of, if they're seen to be bragging, they're perceived negatively. If a man says something like, I'm really good at this, I do that, then it's normal. But when a woman says it, it seems like, oh, she's pushing, you know. And women, and you will always hear women say, and I don't mean to brag, or I don't want to seem, because they're aware of it subconsciously, they may not have the, the, the knowledge of it or know how to articulate it, but they feel it when they say something good, they always take it back. Oh, I'm excellent at this. And then they, they, they pull it back. They say, oh, not, you know. I mean, I'm not really that good. And so, as you say, you have to figure out how to do that, how to demonstrate your value in a way that doesn't trigger that double bind where you're perceived negatively. And that takes time. And that's another reason why you have to build that personal brand, because if you don't, you will be Trip, tripped up on that all the time. You will say, I know a lot of women sit and go, oh my goodness. When they think back to meetings, they, they realize I miss opportunities to insert and to demonstrate my value. And without a personal, van, a personal brand, you will continue to do that. Miss wonderful natural opportunities to demonstrate your value without coming over like you're bragging. And so even though I don't like the term personal brand, I do understand how essential it is to um, women leaders. If you're talking about how do I want to utilize my power and how do I want to access my power as a leader? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm glad that we got there. <laughs> and so it means then that I think for everyone, which uh, you've highlighted with your comment and, and about the, the way that maybe hearing it made you feel, it therefore says that each person has to identify the way that works best for them to promote their brand. Yes. So some people may choose to do it on social media. You may want to put out every time you get a new qualification or you have a new accomplishment or you receive an award or you go to an event or you're honored or you get a promotion, you put it on social media. You may want to show your, your credibility by being a content creator online. You may not like to use social media as your way of doing that. You may want to do it face to face. So find opportunities to mention projects that you've worked on. Maybe volunteer for things. And as you volunteer for things that you, you can mention to other people, well, you know, I worked on similar projects or be a part of committees and talk about your skill and your expertise and demonstrate what you're able to do. So there are different ways you can do it. 
One, of course, a really good one that a lot of people forget is write down the things on your resume. Because believe it or not, we forget some of the mm -hmm. things that we've done and some of the accomplishments we've had. We don't include them in our resume. And then when people see it, it's like you, you had... You did the same thing for the last 20 years when, in fact, there were like 10 other things you did along the way that you didn't mention because you don't want to boast and brag. But remember, it's not bragging if it's true. And if you did it, you earned it, you have the skill, the knowledge, and the expertise, there's nothing wrong with you mentioning it. Mm -hmm. And every That's now and again, said. yeah, every now and again, mention to people, you know, I was a part of the project working on it, and this is what I learned from that. Because then you're not bragging, you just threw it into the conversation to explain a context. Yeah, and I think that's why I say it's essential to have a bright book to hear what people um, are telling you. And, and and if we go to leadership, you know, leadership is all about perception as well. You intend to be a great leader, but you have to get feedback from people to tell you what is landing well and what isn't. And people are a great source of telling you what you're doing good that you don't, because as you and I know, we don't often see ourselves clearly. We don't see all the good that we do. And and asking some person, how can I be a better leader? If you're a great leader, they'll tell you, well, I love that you do X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. but, uh, and here is where you can work on, what you can work on to be considered, you know, to be even better. And, and even if they don't have anything for you to improve, they may tell you what you're doing well and what they would like to continue to see more of, which again is good feedback that you're pulling in from your network, your community to really make yourself better um, as a leader, being able to better figure out how to get to those win-wins that are essential for you moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the third point that I would make is commit to continuous learning and development. And let me put a caveat. I'm not saying to get more degrees. I'm not saying that you need to go to university and get another certificate or another certification or another qualification. But committing, I mean, it's okay if you choose to do that, but I'm not saying that you have to do that in order to build your power. What it says is that you need to make sure that you're open to learning new ways of doing things, building new skills and new expertise. And sometimes that can come from experience. And so the reason why sometimes there are individuals who get ahead at work with less qualifications than others who have rows and rows of degrees is mm. because the ones with the less qualifications spent the time learning the practical approach and the practical experience. And so they have the ability to demonstrate repeated opportunities that they practiced, they did, they achieved, they accomplished. So you're going through that, learning something, trying something that you may not know very well and getting better at it, being a part of a committee, being on a, a team that's working on a project. All of those represent the opportunities to learn. One of the things that was also mentioned in the research is that women being part of women-led organizations where they could learn skills and build confidence and be a part of different types of activities was also useful as part of your learning curve and was useful as part of your growth and your ability to be successful. So consider that there is great importance in your being committed to ongoing learning and development, but don't get trapped in the next qualification, more papers, more degrees trap. But instead, think of the skills, the expertise, and improving your ability to do. Yep, 100% agree with that, particularly the don't get caught in the trap of yet another qualification or degree. So you can feel confident that you have something to say. Yeah. You know, knowledge is so which, as we know, is all part of that imposter syndrome that we all talk about and happens to so many of us. We often talk about it with regards to women and uh, your role in leadership positions, but we know that it may very well be happening to our male counterparts as well. Yeah. But what tends to happen is women, a lot of women feel, well, I need to get a qualification in this area so that I can speak about it and my opinions on it can be accepted. Whereas you don't necessarily get that same 
idea coming from your male counterpart. They believe that they have an opinion and they have expertise and they've done things in the past. And so they are quite confident to express an opinion. And that's something that we all, I think, as leaders need to learn that it's okay for you to express an opinion. I mean, other people may not accept it. That's all right. It doesn't take away the value of your opinion and it doesn't take away the value of your knowledge. So you don't feel that the only way you can speak on something is if you have a certification in it. Yes. And I think the system builds imposter syndrome, right? And that tells me that the first step, you need to go right back to the first step um, mm -hmm. where we say that self-interrogation, because why do I feel this way? I'll tell mm -hmm. you why. Everything within the system is built for you to think that. You mm -hmm. don't see yourself reflected. You're not accustomed to hear so everything along the way. And if you don't know that, then you will fall into it rather than reject the invitation to head down into that path again, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, we know, you and I know that that never goes away, but we learn to decline the invitation. No, yeah. thank you. We're not going <laughs> down the alley. We're staying on this highway. <laughs> or this or as can sometimes happen, you don't realize that you're headed down the alley until you look up and it's dark. And all you see around you is darkness and you're like, how did I get here? Well, then go, yeah. oh, sorry, no, not going any further. Let's back on out of this. And back on out of this and move forward. And that's really important. So I 100% I agree with that. If I was to add one more thing to what you are saying, one of the key things is to know how to rest, recover, and rejuvenate. Oh, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Women are continue swinging. You're tired. You're exhausted. And sis, sit and rest. Mm -hmm. That's part of working hard is to know when to unplug and rest. And if you are in an environment where you don't have that, then you're not just acknowledge you're not going to be at your effective best. And so you have to find ways you have to put all that intellect and that hard work into figuring out how can I build rest, recovery and rejuvenation into my daily, weekly, monthly, yearly practices. Because without mm -hmm. that, you're just a battery that's just going to die. And one day, this is what happens with women all, you know, all the time, it happens with men too, but we're focusing on women here. You are going to get up and your body is going to say, no, I'm not, not today. <laughs> not today. I am not moving. <laughs> you have abused me enough. I have given you lots of <laughs> indicators that I'm not working well. And so you're going to like try to get up and it's like, no, I am not moving. And only then will you pay attention. And then what often happens is you, you give your body and your mind just enough to recover to, to you know so you can get up but you don't give it enough to fully recover right um to not to recover to be functioning to be barely mm -hmm. functioning but you don't give it enough to recover so unless being an excellent and great leader is an understanding that you are not a machine and that you need and that rest recovery and rejuvenation is a critical part of you being your best and performing your best and if you don't take well, you don't take care of the resource, the human resource of you, then you're going to have problems. Okay. And I think that that is an excellent point for us to wrap up on, because if nothing else, we know we have to remember if we don't keep this vessel strong, we can't do any of these things that we have been talking about. And we've had a very good discussion on leadership on power and on influence and on the strategies and steps that we can pick to that we can take to build more of that because really to be an effective leader means that you are able to influence people to make that journey with you so that you can achieve that vision you have for yourself so as always sonia it has been a pleasure we it had a been. great discussion and we will be back in about a month or so to talk more about leadership and about leadership development and what it takes to continue to build and grow in those roles. So thank you very much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next time.
Okay, bye.